Oh, good afternoon, guys. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our very last uh, set of speakers. And we have a panel discussion on challenging cases in OB anesthesia. And so uh, Dr. Andy Miller, as well as Dr. John Waters, will be presenting. And uh, Dr. Miller actually initially started his training in critical care. He then did an anesthesia residency at Brigham and Women's and went on to do his uh, OB Neurology Fellowship there as well. Um, he worked for many, many years um, at Brigham and Women's, and we were recently fortunate enough to recruit him to our system. In addition, we have um, Dr. Jonathan Waters, who will be speaking for us. Um, last but not least, um, he is the second member of the OB Anesthesia Panel. He's a professor in the Department of Anesthesia, as well as bioengineering. He's also the director of the blood management program at UPMC. His most important role, however, is he's my husband, father of my three kids, and the love of my life. With no further ado, John, would you like to come on and join us? Okay, neurologic complications with obstetrical anesthesia. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. So, um, as an OB anesthesiologist, there's kind of two complications that uh, I face on a almost a daily basis. One is uh, hemorrhage, um, which is my own expertise, and then neurologic complications are, are very common also, which it's fortunate to have my wife on speed dial. Um, so I'm going to share a couple of cases um, with you. Before I do so, um, these are my disclosures. Um, I, I'm a consultant for Levanova, which is a company that manufactures cell salvage equipment, as well as Hemonetics, um, which is a company that's headquartered in Boston. And then Vitalant is the provider of our blood um, for UPMC and a lot of other places. So um, around here, we are known as uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dr. Waters. Um, this is our wedding picture, and it's got an interesting tale that goes along with the picture. Um, I was put through uh, medical school by the U.S. Navy, and um, um, I had just reported for duty at the Naval Hospital in San Diego. Um, when I got a phone call from my commanding officer, and I, th I believe it was August 15th of 1990, and he said, uh, John, don't, don't come to work tomorrow. Um, I want you to report to Camp Pendleton because you're going to get deployed to the Middle East. And so I reported to Camp Pendleton um, the next morning um, where the first thing they had us do was to fill out our death benefits. And when I went to assign a, my death benefits to my girlfriend of eight years, they said, no, you can't do that. It's got to be a next of kin. So I called up the base chaplain and said, can you marry me today? And he said, sorry, I got seven, 78 weddings to do today. Um, why don't you look to uh, the justice of the peace that's outside the front gate of Camp Pendleton? So I called up a place called I Do Weddings, um, and <clears throat> we got married later that afternoon. Unfortunately, my wife was wearing a white dress um, that was just fortuitous. At any rate, um, the first case that I'm going to present is uh, this one, um, a 26-year-old uh, G1P0 who presented to triage and labor at 38 weeks. Um, the patient was a known breach with a failed version five days before. Um, she basically had no uh, medical history to speak of. Um, these are her vital signs on presentation. Um, you can see they're all pretty much normal. <clears throat> now, this is the anesthesia record, and I'll give you a quick uh, tutorial of how to read this particular record. Um, the diastolic and systolic blood pressures are indicated by those little carrots. Um, and they go in different directions depending upon whether or not it's um, systolic or diastolic. And then the mean blood pressure is represented by X's. And so this particular patient got our routine, which is a spinal anesthetic. Um, 
and she got 1.6 mLs of bupivacaine and then um, some morphine included. Now, one of the things that we do routinely is to start a phenylephrine infusion on these patients um, because one of the side effects of the spinal anesthesia um, is hypotension, um, and patients get extremely nauseous. Um, sometimes they get panicky. Um, so the phenylephrine has become our default infusion um, during the course of these cases. Now, this patient, um, the phenylephrine didn't do the job. Her, she dropped her blood pressure um, fairly precipitously. Um, so I asked the resident who was working with me to give her a little ephedrine, which is another um, presser agent. And instead of giving a little, he gave 15 milligrams, which is a fairly sizable amount in conjunction with the phenylephrine. And you can see what happened to her blood pressure here in the middle of the page. Um, her um, diastolic pressures were well over 120. Um, her systolic pressures were pushing 200. Um, so um, <clears throat> at this point, um, I thought I'd just ride it out, let the, let the pressures wear off. Um, but they didn't, um, and it went on for about 10 minutes where she was severely hypertensive. Um, and at one point, uh, she turns to me and says, is it normal to see things fluttering in the corner of my eye? And I was like, no, I don't think so. Um, at which point, um, she had a tonic-clonic seizure, as indicated by the red arrow. Um, so this was this is how it all went down. Um, she basically complained of that that little fluttering um, in the corner of her eye. When she started seizing, uh, as all anesthesiologists do, we immediately reached for the propofol and the Versed um, to control the seizure, um, which it did. This is where it comes in handy to have a neurologist wife. Um, the uh, <coughs> um, my major concern at this point was that we had driven her blood pressure up so high um, that she had ruptured an aneurysm, and that's what led to the seizure. Um, and so um, what we did is we scheduled her for an emergent CT scan, uh, and Janet met us in the alcove in our CT scanner. Um, at which point she did a neurologic exam, which was um, focal, um, with her reflexes being brisker on the right side than on the left. And so it's like, damn, um, we did something bad to her. So was it our fault? Um, I think the answer is uh, unquestionable. Um, it was, but these were the things that were going through my mind um, when this ha happened. Um, you know, did we um, give her a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Um, did she have an unrecognized um, brain tumor? Or is it what most obstetricians diagnose as eclampsia? And this was the results of the CT. Um, she ended up having posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, um, which is kind of unusual to make this diagnosis based on a CT scan. It's usually done with an MRI. Um, but our radiologists are so experienced at looking at these things that they um, have some ability to make this diagnosis. <clears throat> so um, press syndrome, um, also known as hypertensive encephalopathy, um, <clears throat> We caused it by driving up um, her blood pressure, um, basically. Um, you can see this during other, other um, medical problems, um, such as renal failure, blood pressure fluctuations, which is exactly what happened with this particular patient. And um, these are what these drugs are. Phenylephrine is a selective alpha-1 adrenergic um, receptor agonist, and ephedrine is an indirect acting alpha-1 and beta um, adrenergic receptor agonist. Um, and these two um, drugs in, in conjunction um, basically drove this patient's um, brain vasculature outside of the range of autoregulation, which is shown here, is that uh, when you do drive it, out of that autoregulation, you get hyperperfusion. Um, and um, 
unbalance the starling forces that keep uh, fluid within uh, the vasculature. Um, so we had driven this patient's blood pressure up to the point where she, her capillaries in her brain had leaked. So this is kind of the, the conclusion um, of this particular case. Um, Press syndrome can be caused um, by well-intentioned anesthesiologists. So that's case one. Um, the second case is a, an interesting case um, that I worked on with my wife also. <clears throat> um, it was a 34-year-old obese female who was uh, a G1P0 um, who was 31 weeks pregnant, um, who acutely developed left-sided weakness at 1040 at night. And um, she came into our ED about one hour after the symptoms onset. And this is her blood pressure. She was awake and alert. Um, and she, but she had this visual defect. Um, and <clears throat> so basically, she has an evolving stroke. Um, and I won't belabor the neurologic exam because I don't really understand it. Um, but anyway, her NIH stroke scale um, was 12 um, when she initially presented. So um, an MRI, MRA was, was obtained, and this is what it showed. Um, and you can see on the far right, the MRI um, shows an internal uh, carotid artery occlusion. Um, the distal part of the internal um, carotid. And so um, how do you manage a, a stroke in a, a woman that's 31 weeks pregnant? Um, this is one of the options is TPA, um, and that the American Heart Association and the American Stroke Association um, have this as uh, something that you can do um, in the early management of, of strokes in pregnancy. Or you could not put stents um, and do a thrombectomy, which is what our radiologist um, chose to do. Um, and this is kind of what they did. Um, they uh, um, basically sucked out um, this particular clot that was leading to this person's uh, neurologic findings. Um, and then they put uh, two bare metal stents um, into her internal carotid artery. Um, because they felt like it took a particularly torturous um, uh, direction um, within this woman's brain. And so bare metal stents will clot off if you don't um, use anticoagulants. And in this case, they started off with the tip of the tide um, <clears throat> during the procedure, and then they put her on clopidogrel um, and aspirin, um, at which point... Uh, her stroke symptoms had fully resolved. The problem is she's 31 weeks pregnant, so how do you go about managing um, this particular patient when she's about to deliver and have a blood loss of somewhere between 500 and 1,000 cc's on clopidogrel and aspirin? So what is clopidogrel? Um, it's basically a P2Y12 um, ADP um, antagonist, um, which um, prevents ADP from causing the platelets to aggregate. Um, and um, there's limited data on the use of this particular drug in cesarean sections. What is in the literature um, basically is um, in patients that have coronary stents where clopidogrel um, was used um, prior to a cesarean section. And in, in the four cases that are in the literature, um, the blood loss in these cases in the, is in the four to five liter um, range, which is significantly greater um, than what uh, we normally anticipate for a C-section. So um, what do you do? Um, and this patient didn't want to labor um, because she was not a candidate for neuraxial anesthesia or epidural anesthesia because of the, um, the clopidogrel. Um, so she kind of opted for a, an elective cesarean section under general anesthesia. Um, now, clopidogrel has a, a seven-day um, duration of action, um, so you generally have to wait um, for seven days um, when, you, when you stop it prior to doing any kind of surgical procedure. Otherwise, you can end up with lots of bleeding. Um, 
And this was something that our um, stroke um, team felt was too long of a period of time to wait um, when this patient was um, nine weeks following um, bare metal stents being placed. Um, and they were quite um, alarmed that the patient stood a very high probability of um, restroking, and I think the quote was 25% um, during that seven-day period. So we did a, a thromboelastograph, um, and this is the thromboelastograph tracing, um, which if you're familiar with the, the thromboelastograph, um, the numbers down below in orange, um, green, blue, and purple, um, those are the prime um, numbers that we look at, and this was a totally normal um, um, tag tracing. Now, one, one of the things that I learned from this particular case was that uh, the platelets are stimulated by thrombin uh, when a tag is done. Um, the ADP receptors are over, overcome because thrombin is such a strong platelet activator. So all of the antiplatelet drugs are not going to show any effect on a thromboelastograph uh, because of how the platelets are, are stimulated um, to activate and aggregate. So I called up a buddy of mine. Um, Amy might know him. Um, I don't know. He's a um, cardiac surgeon at the University of Kentucky, and uh, he and I had sat on a committee at NIH a number of years ago where he had ex expressed an interest in these P2Y12 um, antagonists. And so I called Vic up and said, Vic, what can I do? And he said, well, there's this fancy new P2Y12 antagonist or, um, called Cangrelor. Um, it's like, well, what's that? Um, and what it is is it's a very short-acting um, P2Y12 uh, antagonist that has a six-minute half-life. Um, so we decided that this was the option that we were going to go down because we wouldn't have to put this patient at risk of, of restroking. So we infused um, Cangrelor for um, five days um, prior to taking her to the operating room. Um, then um, we basically were anticipating a major blood loss. Um, but what we did is because of the short half-life, um, upon induction of anesthesia, we stopped the Cangrelor, um, proceeded with the C-section, um, and uh, it took us 25 minutes from incision to closure, um, during which time the cangrelor infusion um, was stopped and it was restarted at the end of the incision or at the end of the surgery when we were assured that the blood loss was going to be normal. So, um, and believe it or not, um, there was only 400 cc's of blood loss for this particular case, which is um, remarkably low for a cesarean section, which is normally um, a leader. So um, in this case, um, I think we probably learned that perhaps TPA might have been a better choice um, for management of this stroke um, because it does present a quandary, you know, with a pregnant patient as to how you're going to deliver. Um, and so I will finish there and uh, leave it to Andy.